three, two, one. Welcome back to my channel. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Becky and I do true crime videos. Today's case, we are going to be talking about the Suffolk Strangler. His name's Steve Wright. Thank you for your patience whilst I have been getting this video out. I really, really took my time with this video and just wanted to make sure that these victims' stories were heard. I wanted to make sure that each woman had a little bit more of a background instead of just being known as a sex worker. I thought that's really important because at the end of the day, they're somebody's daughter, friend, sister, whoever. They're still a person. I feel like when I'm researching true crime videos, if you have an addiction, if you work a certain lifestyle, especially sex work, I feel like you're treated differently. Today's video is graphic, so I'll put up all my trigger warnings as usual. There will be links in the description if you are affected by anything or if you want to learn more and educate yourself or others. If you would like me to do videos on the other possible victims, please let me know. I'd be up for doing that. I hope everybody's staying happy, safe, and healthy, and I will see you next week. In 2006, the community of Suffolk were horrified when five bodies were found in 10 days. Tanya Nichols, who was aged just 19, was one of the first victims. Tanya was last seen alive on October 30th. She got the bus into town just after 11 p.m. She was working as a sex worker to fund her drug addiction. Tanya was described as a happy, smiling girl whose parents split up when she was just a child. She left home and began taking drugs at the age of 16. Tanya worked at a massage parlor but was fired due to her addiction. She moved back home to live with her mother Carrie and her brother. However, her family had no idea about her lifestyle until she went missing. Tanya's family hadn't heard from her in 48 hours and was reported missing by her mom. Then, a second woman went missing. Gemma Adams, aged 25, was last seen in the area surrounding London Road on November 15, 2006. Her boyfriend took her into that location to do work and he expected to see her after. He reported her missing on the same day. Gemma was described as a kind person, a nice person to talk to, and a loyal friend. Gemma was a former brownie who played the piano and loved horses. However, she fell in with a bad crowd after finishing school and became hooked on heroin. Her parents, Gail and Brian, tried to help her quit her addiction, but nothing worked. After losing her job with an insurance company, she began working in the massage parlor with Tanya before taking to the streets. Just like Tanya's family, Gemma's parents only found out that their daughter was a sex worker after she went missing. Unfortunately, on December 2nd, 2006, Gemma's body was found in a brook. Due to her body being submerged for two weeks, the police did not know who the victim was straight away, and this made it difficult to find any evidence or DNA on the body. For a week, divers explored the brook, and police explored nearby woodland. On December 8th, right before they were about to call off the search, Tanya's body was found. She had been missing for six weeks. Just like Gemma's body, due to it being in water, this made it extremely difficult to find any evidence. CCTV footage showed Tanya getting into a dark car on the night of her disappearance. However, the footage was not clear enough to read the registration plate or identify the driver. The police didn't know it yet, but the CCTV footage was on the same street that Steve Wright lived on. On December 10th, 2006, a third body was found in Nacton. The victim was a 24-year-old mother of one, Anna Lee Alderton. She was described as a free spirit and was cool to hang around with. However, she was never reported missing. Her body was found on dry land, which was different from the two previous bodies. She was found nude and positioned in a crucifix position. 
Anna Lee was identified through her tattoos. The autopsy later revealed that she was three months pregnant and passed away due to asphyxiation. Anna Lee lived in Colchester with her boyfriend. The police were confused to why the boyfriend never reported her missing. He said that Anna Lee would often go missing for three or four days at a time, and when she left, they were on good terms so he wasn't worried. He also said that Anna Lee told him that she was going to visit her mother and drop off Christmas presents for her son. The mother said that Anna Lee made it to drop off the presents. Anna Lee was last seen on CCTV traveling back from Harwich to Ipswich. The people in the media wanted answers. One media outlet went down to the red light district and anonymously interviewed a sex worker. Why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know. Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars. You know? But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. The sex worker who was interviewed was Paula Clinet. She was a mother and wanted to change her life. She was described as happy, however, was constantly trying so hard to change her lifestyle. Just six days after that interview, Paula was reported missing. A fifth woman was reported missing, that of 29-year-old Annette Nichols. She took time for her friends, was always happy, and greeted everyone with a smile. Annette had a happy life as a mom and was a beauty therapist. However, her life unraveled after an ex-boyfriend introduced her to heroin four years before her death. When her family found out that she was a sex worker, Annette was ashamed but she had to continue funding her addiction. She gave her son to her mom, Rosemary, so he could receive the best care. She was close friends with Paula. On December 12th, a body was found in Levington, in the woodlands, just a few feet from the road. In order to search for evidence, a helicopter scoured the area, and that's when a fifth body was discovered only a hundred yards away. The two bodies found on December 12th were Annette and Paula. Just like the other victims, they were found asphyxiated, and some of the victims were found either fully or partially nude. Personal belongings from each victim were taken. None of the five victims had signs of sexual assault. The three bodies found on dry land came back with DNA. This DNA was ran through the crime database, and there was only one in a billion chance that the DNA was Steve Wright. Steve had been pulled over during the routine stops, however, was never on the police's radar. So, who is Steve Wright? Steve Wright was born in Erpingham, Norfolk, in 1958. His father, Conrad, was a military policeman, and they lived in the nearby RFA West Beckingham. The family moved around a lot due to being stationed in different locations. Wright was one of four children. His mother, Patricia, walked out when he was just eight years old, and she took Wright's two sisters with her. The father then remarried. His stepmother, Val, described Wright as a gentle person, he never forgets birthdays or anniversary and hasn't got a malicious bone in his body. She said, I've known him for 40 years and I've never seen him lose his temper. Wright's brother said that the family were quite close growing up. He was described by gentle and quiet by some of the sex workers that he had picked up. Wright's work history was wide and varied. By the 1980s, he was a steward on a QE2 liner, and whilst on shore in Thailand, he would often use workers, and he would often return from the sea broke. On a later trip back to Thailand, it is believed he went through a marriage service to a local girl who reportedly swindled him. He returned home penniless and was taken in by his father and stepmother Val. 
In 2001, Wright worked as a barman at the Brooke Hotel in Flexen Stowe. However, in 2002, at the age of 44, he was fired for stealing hundreds of pounds, for which he was ordered to carry out 100 hours of community service. It was that DNA sample taken at the time of the conviction which led to police matching samples taken from the bodies. He was twice married and twice divorced. Allegedly, there was domestic abuse in the relationships. He then gambled all of his money away and was declared bankrupt. Due to the stress of the financial trouble, he attempted to take his own life. In 2006, he was now 48, and he moved to the red light district of Ipswich with his girlfriend. He managed the ferry boat pub in the red light district and worked as a forklift driver. Wright would carry out these murders when the girlfriend was working the night shift. The police didn't arrest Wright straight away. They conducted a 24-hour surveillance. After being arrested, he was then interrogated for eight hours and just replied with no comment. He never confessed, however, the police charged him due to the forensic evidence. The police seized Wright's car in which they found fake fur fibers that matched Annette's fur jacket and found Paula's blood. When examining his home, they found Annette's and Paula's blood on a high-vis jacket. However, there was still nothing to tie Wright to Tanya's and Gemma's death. Forensics examined fibers found in Tanya's and Gemma's hair, which matched to Wright's tracksuit, sofa, and carpet fiber from his car. There was also DNA found on Wright's gloves. The trial began in 2008 and he pleaded not guilty. Wright argued that he had picked the woman up for sex but did not harm them. Allegedly, he fell apart during cross-examination. On February 2008, after six hours of deliberation, he was given a whole life order, meaning that he will never be released. He is currently in Long Larton Prison. Allegedly, Wright was arrested and brought in for questioning regarding the unsolved murder of 17-year-old Victoria Hall in 1999. The police never confirmed or denied whether it was Wright who was the new suspect. However, the man was released a day later. I will give some background into Victoria's case. She was walking home from Bandbox nightclub with her best friend Gemma Algar in the early hours of the morning when she vanished. The pair had stopped at a takeaway before saying goodbye at 2.30 a.m., just 300 yards from Victoria's home. Gemma later heard screams, but believed someone was just messing around. Her parents woke up the next morning and realized that Victoria had not come home and alerted police. Tragically, Victoria's body was discovered on September 24th, 1999. I will explain why people think that Wright might be responsible for Hall's murder. However, I want to stress that the police have not said that Wright is connected to her death, and as of today, no one has been charged. Just like Wright's victims, Hall had been asphyxiated and there was no signs of sexual assault. Her clothes and possessions were never found. However, Victoria was not a worker. She was studying for her A-levels in English, sociology and business studies and was hoping to go to university. She didn't even drink or smoke. However, just like Jack the Ripper in other cases, not all of their victims were sex workers. However, I don't want to diminish the fact that just because she wasn't a sex worker, she may have not been murdered by Wright. Additionally, Wright is said to have been one of 12,000 people featured on a database drawn up by detectives after his car registration number provided a partial match for a vehicle which followed a girl the night before Victoria disappeared. He was never questioned. A retired police officer said 
There was no reason to see him. At the time, there was thousands of lines of inquiry. There was no evidence to suggest that we should have followed it up. An image has been released of a man visiting the scene where Victoria's body was found. The image was taken by a camera installed by officers to capture anyone visiting the scene as they believed the killer might return. It showed a grainy figure getting out of a vehicle, walking around and then driving off at 12.34 on October 7th, 1999 about three weeks after Victoria's body was discovered. At the time, it appeared that Suffolk police didn't follow up or identify the vehicle or driver. I made this map in order to show you where Wright's victims' bodies were found compared to Victoria Hall's. Gemma Adams' body, which was the farthest body away from Victoria Hall's, was only a 48-minute drive, and allegedly Wright lived in Felix Stowe at the time of Victoria's disappearance and murder. And then Anna Lee, Paula, and Annette's body was just a 13 to 14 minute drive from where Victoria Hall was found. Allegedly, Victoria's parents do not believe that Wright is responsible for Victoria's death. Another possible victim of Wright was estate agent Susie Lamplew who is age 25 at the time of her disappearance. She worked alongside Wright on the QE2 luxury cruise liner, and he is even said to have allegedly chatted her up. However, Wright's ex-wife, Diana Cole, said that at the time of Susie's disappearance and when it was hitting the headlines, Wright denied ever knowing her. According to Wright's ex-wife, she witnessed Wright flirting with Susie on the cruise liner. Allegedly, Wright regularly met up with Susie when he later moved to Brixton, in South London, where he ran a pub. Wright's own father also wondered if he was behind Susie's disappearance after finding a photo of them together from the 1980s. Susie's family are demanding that Wright also be quizzed over her suspected murder. Susie's brother Richard told the Sunday Mirror, I don't see any reason why the police couldn't speak to Wright about Susie's murder. If Wright's dad thought he was a possibility, it would be good to know whether he was around at the time in Fulham and Putney. Susie vanished on July 28, 1986, after leaving her London office to meet a Mr. Kipper for a viewing at a Fulham flat. A witness reported a woman talking to a man on the street and then getting into his car. Susie's car was later found a mile and a half away with her purse still inside. Susie's body was never found and she was declared dead, presumed murdered, five years later. Allegedly Wright was on shore leave around the time of Susie's disappearance and he used the word kipper as slang for face. There are claims that say that Susie invented the client, Mr. Kipper, to run a personal errand and collect the diary and checkbook that she had left in the pub the night before. Scotland Jard previously investigated Wright's links to Susie after it was found out that they worked together on the QE2. Wright was jailed in 2008 and ruled out of Susie's case by police in 2012. Investigators had already pointed the finger at John Cannon. He was a serial rapist who was convicted of killing two women in Bristol and Reading. While the Crown Prosecution Service decided that there was insufficient evidence to charge Cannon, Scotland Yard held a press conference where officers named him as the man that they believed murdered Susie. Mr. Veitset A man who spent five years researching a book called Finding Susie said, From speaking to former officers who worked on two previous investigations, I have found it is widely accepted within the police that there is no evidence to support John Cannon ever knowing Susie or ever even meeting her. Retired Detective Superintendent Jim Dickey disagrees with this statement, adding, I still firmly believe Cannon is responsible for killing Susie.
There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points to him. I do not believe that it's Steve Wright. If you look at his offending profile, it's all suckers. It's all geographically in the same area. I said some years ago that Wright is not in the frame. His offending profile just does not match at all. Police strongly believe if Wright was never caught, he would have just kept murdering women. To this day, he maintains his innocence and Wright has never given a reason to why he murdered those women. That is the end of today's video. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Bye!